It was another tumultuous year for the world in 2021, continuing the trend from 2020. Faced with unprecedented changes, many countries are experiencing unprecedented challenges. What progress has China made in diplomacy in the year 2021? And what actions would China take to safeguard world peace and promote international governance and true multilateralism? Welcome to this very special edition of The Point, coming to you at the end of the year 2021 as we enter a new year. And my special guest is State Councillor and Minister of Foreign Affairs of the People's Republic of China, Mr. Wang Yi. Mr. Wang, welcome to The Point. The year 2021 marks the 20th anniversary of the signing of China-Russia Treaty of Good Neighborhood and Friendly Cooperation. China and Russia have been acting in line with their responsibilities as major countries. How do you see the significance of this in terms of maintaining global strategic stability and development? How do you evaluate the current state of China-Russia relations? China is a world influence. China and Russia are both major countries with global influence. Their strategic coordination and practical cooperation has a global significance and plays an irreplaceable role. This year, the two countries solemnly commemorated the 20th anniversary of the signing of the Treaty of Good Neighborliness and Friendly Cooperation between China and Russia. President Xi Jinping and President Vladimir Putin officially announced the renewal of the treaty and made it more relevant in the new era. The two presidents have stayed in close strategic communication throughout the year and will get together for the Winter Olympics in a little over a month. Guided by the two presidents, China-Russia relations have become more mature, stable, resilient and vibrant. On pandemic response, China and Russia have served as a good example for the world. With solidarity and mutual assistance, the two countries have been pioneering in vaccine research, development, production and global distribution, and jointly opposed the stigmatization and politicization of issues related to the coronavirus and its origins tracing, showing other members of the international community that solidarity is the right way to fight the pandemic. On global economic recovery, China and Russia have provided a strong impetus. Their all-dimensional cooperation was greatly elevated to higher levels. Bilateral trade has registered a new record. Major strategic projects are well underway, and cooperation on scientific and technological innovation is advancing rapidly. This has not only improved the well-being of the two countries and peoples, but also created new opportunities for world economic recovery. On regional stability, China and Russia have provided a solid safeguard. The two countries have maintained high-level strategic coordination, promoted a constructive role of the SCO and BRICS, and strengthened strategic coordination on hotspot issues. These efforts are the core pillar for regional stability and solidarity among developing countries. On global governance, China and Russia have demonstrated our sense of responsibility. The two countries firmly upheld the UN-centered international system and the international order underpinned by international law. We jointly opposed interference in other countries' internal affairs, unilateral sanctions and long-arm jurisdiction. Our efforts have helped build a bulwark supporting the practice of true multilateralism and upholding international equity and justice, showing the world how major countries should behave. We are convinced that as long as China and Russia, as two major countries, stand together shoulder to shoulder and deepen coordination hand in hand, the international order will not fall into disarray justice in the world will not collapse, and hegemonism will not win. The EU describes China as a partner, but also as a systemic rival. And the ratification of the China-EU Comprehensive Investment Treaty has met difficulties because of internal problems within the EU. Where do you see Sino-European relations going next? And uh, what will China do to promote to push for the ratification of the investment treaty. This year, new progress has been made in many areas in the relations between China and Europe. President Xi Jinping has chaired two video summits with French and German leaders. The China CEEC summit has been held successfully via video link. 
Premier Li Keqiang also engaged extensively with European leaders and business community. Economic and trade cooperation between the two sides has enjoyed positive growth despite overall difficulties, with trade volume for the whole year expected to increase by 30 percent from last year to exceed U.S. $800 billion. The China-EU agreement on geographical indications has come into force. High-level dialogues on the environment and climate in the digital field have been officially launched. The number of freight services of the China-Europe Railway Express recorded a new high. New progress has been made in flagship belt and road projects such as the Paracas Port and the Budapest-Belgrade Railway. The two sides share extensive consensus on such issues as upholding multilateralism and enhancing global governance and have achieved positive outcomes in tackling climate change and jointly responding to COVID-19. That said, we have also noticed that Europe's policy towards China seems to suffer from cognitive dissonance. It is hard to imagine that on one hand, Europe seeks to build a comprehensive strategic partnership with China, and on the other hand, it defines China as a systemic rival. This logic has not only undermined China-Europe relations, but also brought confusion to European friends themselves. Difference in systems does not mean China and Europe have to be rivals. The two sides could well respect each other, learn from each other, and complement each other. In this context, we stand ready to have closer engagement and communication and earnestly enhance mutual understanding between China and Europe, including open, candid dialogue on such topics as human rights and democracy. Moreover, we hope that Europe, as an important force in the process toward greater multipolarity, will shape an independent, objective and rational perception of China at an early date and promote and deepen its mutually beneficial cooperation with China following the principle of strategic autonomy. If China and Europe, as two great civilizations, major forces and big markets, can draw on each other's strength and forge synergy on the basis of mutual respect, this will augur well for the world and humanity. On the China-EU Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, it is an economic and trade agreement with the highest level of opening up and lowest market access threshold to date for China. It is good for China and even better for Europe. Obstacles to the agreement are obstacles to one's own development and will hurt the long-term interests of the European people. In November 2021, Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, presided via video link the uh, special summit to commemorate the 30th anniversary of uh, China-ASEAN dialogue relations. And uh, he announced with ASEAN counterparts to elevate bilateral relations to that of a uh, comprehensive strategic partnership. So looking back in 2021, how do you evaluate the development of China's diplomacy with neighboring countries in 2021? This year has been a year of progress and harvest for China and other Asian countries. China has strengthened and upgraded its relations with ASEAN. The two sides have stood together in fighting COVID-19. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership has been signed and will soon enter into force. China and ASEAN have stepped up cooperation in the digital economy, blue economy and green economy. Connectivity has been accelerated across the board, and the China-Laos Railway has successfully started operation. The South China Sea issue has been effectively managed under the framework of the Declaration on the Conduct of Parties in the South China Sea and the freedom of navigation and overflight has been protected in accordance with law. On hotspot issues such as Afghanistan and Myanmar, China has stayed in close coordination with countries in the region to jointly safeguard stability in this part of the world. Asia has remained a region with the greatest vitality and development potential in the world. This has not come by easily. It is the result of years of hard work in solidarity by China and regional countries and it deserves to be cherished by all. Meanwhile, we also see new challenges in this region. There are two divergent trends. One is to jointly pursue development and prosperity through mutual trust and cooperation. The other is to create division and confrontation through erecting walls and decoupling. 
it is important that Asian countries remain clear-eyed, stand firm in their positions, and make the right choice that serves their fundamental and long-term interests. We must not allow any country outside this region to stoke block confrontation in the region and push Asia toward a new Cold War. We must not allow any country outside this region to undermine existing regional cooperation structure and the regional integration process and replace them with one of their own design. We must not allow any country outside this region to provoke an arms race in the region or even proliferation of nuclear weapons and threaten security and stability in Asia. During the 8th Ministerial Conference of the China-Africa Cooperation Forum, uh, which was successfully held in November 2021, Chinese President Xi Jinping proposed to build a China-Africa community of shared future. And um, China has been vowing to step up its relationship with developing countries. So what specific measures will China take to boost these relationships, including those from Africa? This year marks the 65th anniversary of the start of diplomatic relations between China and African countries. Not long ago, we successfully held the 8th Ministerial Conference of the FOCAC, despite the impact of COVID-19. President Xi Jinping put forward the spirit of China-Africa friendship and cooperation for the first time, set out four proposals for building a China-Africa community with a shared future in the new era, and announced nine programs for cooperation with Africa. All this marked a new milestone in the history of China-Africa relations. Meanwhile, China's relations with other members of the developing world, including Latin America and Caribbean countries, Arab countries and Pacific Island countries, have made important headway over the year, with fruitful results made in various areas of cooperation. China is a staunch member of the developing world. No matter how the international situation may evolve, China will unswervingly stand on the side of the developing world and unswervingly deepen mutually beneficial cooperation with other developing countries. China's vote at the United Nations belongs to the developing world. Looking ahead, we will focus on the following priorities. First, upholding the principle of mutual assistance to jointly develop a shield for immunity. China will continue to make all-out efforts to provide developing countries in need with COVID vaccines and essential supplies to ensure vaccine accessibility and affordability in developing countries and help boost their capacity, confidence and resolve to fight the virus. Second, upholding the principle of mutual benefits to jointly develop an engine for development. We will continue to follow the principle of pursuing the greater good and shared interests, advance strategic coordination with other developing countries, increase trade and investment, and expand practical cooperation to support other countries in enhancing capacity for sustainable and self-generated development. Third, upholding the principle of sincerity, real results, amity and good faith to jointly build a bridge for friendship. We will strengthen exchanges and mutual learning with other developing countries in the fields of political parties and political affairs, poverty reduction and development, and medical and health services, deepen friendship among the peoples, jointly safeguard the legitimate rights and interests of the developing countries, and pass on the spirit of friendship and cooperation from generation to generation. The U.S.'s hasty withdrawal from Afghanistan drew scrutiny from the international community. What has China been doing? What role is China playing in terms of resolving or helping resolve hot spot issues such as Afghanistan? In 2021, the entire world witnessed the Kabul moment when the U.S. forces left Afghanistan in a rush. Such irresponsible withdrawal has brought a serious humanitarian crisis to the Afghan people and enormous security challenges to regional stability. The scenes of chaos and even shocking brutality at Kabul airport will stay in the memory of humanity forever as a historic mark on the failure of the so-called democratic transformation. Facing the sudden changes in Afghanistan, China did not sit by but extended a helping hand. 
we immediately reached out to the Afghan people with emergency humanitarian assistance, especially vaccines, food, and winterization supplies. The Afghan people have suffered from years of war and turmoil and should not have to endure the ravages of the pandemic, hunger, and cold anymore. China has actively facilitated international coordination and played a constructive role in a stable transition of the Afghanistan situation. These efforts have been welcomed and praised by people across Afghanistan. As we speak, Afghanistan still faces serious challenges in economy, people's livelihoods, security and governance. China will continue to pursue the policy of friendship toward all Afghan people. We support Afghanistan in building an inclusive government, ending turbulence, restoring stability and rebuilding the country so that the Afghan people will be able to enjoy the benefits of peace and tranquility. I want to stress that major countries should shoulder special and important responsibilities for world peace and stability. In handling hotspot issues, major countries should uphold justice, not seek selfish interests, promote peace, not abuse the use of force, encourage dialogue, not resort to willful sanctions, and respect the views of the countries concerned, not throw their weight around. Over the past year, China has kept firmly in mind and fulfilled its responsibility and mission. We have proposed a five-point initiative on promoting peace and stability in the Middle East, with a view to encouraging countries in the region to escape geopolitical rivalry between big powers and achieve self-strengthening through unity. We have put forward a three-point proposal for the implementation of the two-state solution to facilitate a just settlement of the Palestinian question and effective governance in the state of Palestine. We have introduced a four-point proposal for the settlement of the Syrian issue and supported Syria in accelerating reconciliation and reconstruction as well as returning to the Arab family. We have facilitated the resumption of compliance with the JCPOA to safeguard the international nuclear non-proliferation regime. We have promoted dialogue among relevant parties in Myanmar to encourage a relaunch of democratic transition. We remain committed to peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula and have worked for synchronized progress in the establishment of a permanent peace mechanism and the denuclearization of the peninsula. What has happened proves that China's growing strength increases the force for peace and the rise in China's influence contributes more constructive factors. China will continue working with the rest of the world, play its due role and make greater contribution to international and regional peace. Well, during the past year, we have seen major Western countries and Western forces promulgating the Western liberal values and trying to instigate debates surrounding ideology. Uh, we have seen that on the international arena these days, there have been clashes of different concepts, different visions, different ideas. Um, could you elaborate a little bit uh, on your understanding of the situation? Some elements in the world still deem themselves superior and always want to impose their own will on others. They throw out arbitrary rules and use human rights, democracy and other high-sounding excuses to smear and contain China and many other developing countries. We must not compromise or back down. Instead, we must face them head-on and pull together with most countries to defend fairness and justice and do the right thing for humanity. The first encounter was between true and false multilateralism. Certain countries, while chanting slogans about multilateralism in rhetoric, are building exclusive blocks in action. They are attempting to throw the world back into Cold War confrontation. In response, China has pointed out unequivocally that countries need to uphold and practice true multilateralism. We have stressed that there is but one international system in the world, for the example of the international system with the UN at its core. Countries need to resolutely uphold the authority and standing of the UN, jointly oppose division and confrontation, stand together against zero-sum games, and make constant efforts for greater democracy in international relations. This position has been recognized and supported by most countries in the world. The second was the encounter between true and false rules. 
A small number of countries talk about a so-called rules-based order, but they refuse to accept that rules should be based on commonly recognized international law. What they actually want is to impose the gang rules by them and their allies on all other countries. In response, China has spoken up repeatedly at the UN and on other multilateral occasions that there is but one set of rules in the world for the example of the basic norms of international relations underpinned by the UN Charter. This strong message laid bare certain countries' intention to practice hegemony under the pretext of rules. It has contributed to the stability of the international order. The third was the encounter between true and false human rights. The U.S. and a few other countries, despite all their own human rights problems, have long sought to use human rights as a tool to meddle with other countries' internal affairs and attack and smear China and other developing countries with groundless accusations. In response, China has stepped forward to set the record straight, articulating China's outlook on human rights and presenting our accomplishments in human rights development. Meanwhile, we have resolutely pushed back false accusations and let the world see the hypocrisy of the self-styled champions of human rights. Justice lies in the heart of people. At the Human Rights Council and the UN General Assembly, we have thwarted, with overwhelming support from other countries, anti-China motions four times in a row this year. Nearly 100 countries expressed their support for China's just stance at the UN and their strong opposition to interference in China's internal affairs under the pretext of human rights. The fourth was the encounter between true and false democracy. The U.S. has staged a so-called summit for democracy and fabricated the false narrative of democracy versus authoritarianism. In response, China has staunchly upheld the common values of humanity, released a report, the state of democracy in the United States, and encouraged inclusive discussions about standards and practices of democracy on bilateral and multilateral occasions. Our efforts have laid bare the self-contradictions and shortages of the U.S. democracy, and the U.S. intention has been widely questioned by the international community. The so-called Summit for Democracy ended hastily with no consensus, no outcome and no future. This has once again proved that democracy is a common value of humanity, on which no country is entitled to lecture others. Ultimately, it is up to the people of a country to say whether or not their democracy is true and effective. The COVID-19 pandemic is still spreading around the world. What has China done in terms of uh, uh, helping unite the world to fight against the virus and uh, helping trace in a scientific manner the origins of the virus and also helping the economic uh, recovery of the world? Since COVID-19 hit, the whole of China has united as one and launched a science-based response, setting a good example of COVID containment for the international community. While bringing the virus under control domestically, China has, from the very beginning, been committed to helping others affected by the virus. We took the initiative to engage in international cooperation against COVID and made contribution to global public health security. China started with global emergency humanitarian assistance, kicking off the first half of the international campaign against the coronavirus with a focus on providing emergency supplies. Up until now, China has provided about 372 billion masks, over 4.2 billion protective suits, and over 8.4 billion testing kits to the international community. Early this year, we began focusing on vaccine cooperation as the international campaign against the virus entered its second half. I wish to take this opportunity to announce that as of 26 December, China has provided more than 2 billion doses of COVID vaccines to over 120 countries and international organizations. China has fulfilled the pledge and commitment made by President Xi Jinping to the rest of the world and has become the biggest provider of outbound vaccines among all countries. One out of every two COVID vaccines administered across the globe is made in China.
For many countries, especially developing countries, the first batch of vaccines and the majority of the vaccines they have received came from China. This sets China apart from certain countries which only make empty promises. Not long ago, President Xi Jinping announced that China will provide another 1 billion doses of COVID vaccines to Africa, including 600 million doses as a donation, to help African countries achieve the goal set by the African Union of vaccinating 60 percent of the African population by 2022. China will also donate additional 150 million doses to ASEAN countries. We support Chinese companies in transferring technologies to developing countries and have launched joint vaccine production with 20 countries. All in all, China did not do any of this for selfish geopolitical interest, and China did not attach any political strings to these actions at all. Rather, we are taking concrete actions to help build a great wall of immunization for the health of all and a health shield for developing countries. Now, the Winter Olympic Games in Beijing will be kicking off, and uh, some countries, including the United States, has decided not to send officials to these games. What is your comment? The Olympic spirit is about friendship, mutual understanding, solidarity, and fair play. The politicization of the Olympics by certain countries completely violates and discredits the Olympic spirit. At the recent 76th session of the UN General Assembly, a resolution on Olympic truce for the Beijing Winter Olympic Games was adopted by consensus. This document, co-sponsored by 173 member states, speaks volumes about the collective commitment of the international community to the Olympic spirit and their strong support for the Beijing Winter Olympics. Athletes of all nationalities are the real stars on the Olympic stage, cheered on by hundreds of millions of sports fans around the world. The political maneuvering of a few Western politicians will do no harm to a splendid Olympic Games, but only expose their ugly intention. Following a green, inclusive, open and clean approach, China will ensure high standard, high quality preparation for the Winter Olympics and present to people of all countries a streamlined, safe and splendid games. We believe that whatever interference there may be, the Beijing Winter Olympics will promote the Olympic spirit, help enhance understanding and friendship between people of different countries, demonstrate the strength of international solidarity and cooperation, and bring more confidence and courage to a world still under the shadow of a pandemic. Thank you so much, Mr. Wang. And with that, we come to the end of this special edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin, coming to you from Beijing. As usual, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Liu Xin in Beijing. Thanks for watching. You've got The Point.